and welcome to Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I'm Mike Allen, here with another story about historically significant people, places, and events from Connecticut's long and fabled past. Today on Amazing Tales, the story of a legendary yet very real character from the late 1880s. He has no name other than the Leatherman. He roamed Connecticut for many years, sleeping in caves. This mysterious figure was, and still is, a fascinating person. Here to talk about the Leatherman is Michael Hoberman, a professor of American literature at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. He's written about the elusive Leatherman, and he also specializes in folklore and oral history, which as you'll hear, is a big part of this overall legendary story. Where do fact and legend meet? It's a good question when you talk about the legacy of the Leatherman. Take Paul Bunyan. No question that Bunyan wasn't real, although he may have been patterned after somebody real, but he was an imaginary figure, a made-up legend. He represented our culture at a time when lumberjacks, loggers, and woodsmen, particularly from Canada, were idolized for their larger-than-life brute strength and outdoor skills. Back in 1916, the Red River Lumber Company produced a promotional pamphlet that displayed Bunyan's likeness. They put a face on an oral tradition that had grown larger than life. It grew into books and cartoons about Paul Bunyan and his mythical sidekick, Babe the Blue Ox. They became a mainstay in American culture for decades. Now take the case of the Leatherman. Unlike Paul Bunyan, the Leatherman was actually quite real. He wasn't some mysterious Bigfoot-like silhouette. No, he was seen by hundreds, photographed often, and even reported on by the newspapers of the day. There are family photo albums scattered throughout Connecticut and New York with photos of him in them. Yet for all of this interaction, there's actually very little of factual substance known about the Leatherman. He got his name because he always wore his hand-stitched wardrobe of second-hand leather pieces. He had sewn them together himself into pants, a coat, and his signature hat with a visor. He attained legendary status because he spent six years of his life walking the same 365-mile route around Connecticut and New York, taking 34 days to do it on each cycle, and he went clockwise every time. He passed through the same towns at virtually the same hour every 34 days. His route covered the Connecticut and New York towns between the Hudson River and the Connecticut River, with the line between Danbury and Hartford serving as more or less the northern limit, and Long Island Sound serving as the southern limit. He went as far east as Guilford. He stayed in caves along the way, away from people. Even during the blizzard of 1888, he turned down an offer to stay at a residence home in Southington, and instead stayed in the cave on the Southington-Berlin border. They surmise that he survived by building a fire on the rock floor of the cave, extinguishing the flames, moving the ashes away, and then curling up against the warm rocks. He had primitive items needed for an overnight stay at each of his caves. He stocked firewood inside to keep it dry for his next visit. At some locations, he even had a vegetable garden where he grew food for himself. He smoked fish, gathered and preserved food, and even tanned leather. Residents who got to know him along his travels would leave food for him, knowing that he'd be there every 34 days, and that's what happened. He would only accept food, however, if it was offered. He never once asked for a handout. He rarely spoke to anybody, unless you happen to speak his native French. When he was offered food, he sometimes replied with a grunt or a word that sounded like tonk. Most people think that that was his way of trying to say thanks. Even those lucky enough to speak with him never got the chance to get particularly close to the leather man. If you ever asked him about himself, for example, who he was, where he came from, well, that would be the last time he would ever visit or speak with you again. So the leather man's life story is somewhat legendary and subject to significant conjecture, which of course leaves a lot of room for embellishment. It's the memories of those who met him, passed down orally over the many decades since the Leatherman passed away, that keep his memory alive, 
Michael Hoberman is a professor of English literature at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. He's devoted much of his studies to what is called oral history. In fact, he did his doctoral thesis on the subject a few decades ago. It's a form of history. In other words, if you want to understand how people experienced the hurricane of 1938 or something like that, you can go to the, the library and look up a bunch of books on it, or you can talk to people who survived it. And even though it's not in a book, Michael says that oral history has a key role to play in our collective memory of things. That kind of oral storytelling to me is just as interesting and just as fascinating and just as sophisticated as published literature is. He says that the telling of legendary tales actually tells us much about ourselves. For example, why do we tell certain stories and why do we tell them certain ways? Which highlights do we accentuate and which do we leave out? His studies have concluded that this tells us a lot about ourselves. It's not whether they're, they're, the content is historically true so much as the fact that people tell them reveals things about who they are and what they care about. So what does this have to do with the leather man? First off, the leather man died in the late 1880s, and we're still talking about him. People are fascinated by him. There's a mystique surrounding him. With what we do know about him, the story is amazing. And when you add that to the fact that there is so little we really know about the person himself as opposed to what he did, it just makes a great formula for legendary status. And much of what we know is from old newspaper articles and verbal recollections of those who had the good fortune to actually interact with him. In other words, oral history, much of which has now been written down into books and articles, but much of which continues to be passed along word of mouth to the next generation. So what do we know about the leather man? Well, perhaps it's easier to start with what we don't know about him. We don't know his name. We don't know where he was born. We don't know his age, although an estimate was made during his autopsy. We don't know why he walked his route, and we don't know why he wouldn't share any information about himself. Okay, so what do we know? Much, but not all, of what we think we know, we learned after his death, from both the autopsy that was performed as well as as an examination of the relics he left behind. He was five feet seven. He had dark hair and gray-blue eyes. His leather coat and pants weighed 60 pounds. His shoes weighed another 10 pounds. They were carved from spruce wood, three quarters of an inch thick, with leather upper sides that he somehow managed to make waterproof. He carried a leather bag with him, and in it were a tobacco pipe, a small tin pail, an awl for working leather, an iron spider for his campfire, which supported the frying pan over the flames, he had the frying pan as well in his leather bag. A jackknife. He had some papers, too, that seemed to have a code for his travels, but nobody ever figured out that code. And he had a French prayer book. He also wore a French crucifix around his neck. Between the prayer book, the crucifix, and the fact that he never ate meat on Fridays, it was understood, even while he was alive, that he was Catholic. He was an avid user of tobacco. He left behind pipes fashioned from tin cans in each of the caves he stayed in on his circuitous routes. He died from blood poisoning brought on by oral cancer. The cancer had unfortunately spread from his lip to his jaw, eating away part of his right cheek and his lower lip, rendering him incapable of chewing solid food at the end. It's estimated that he was in his late 50s. That would place his birth date around 1830. And that would mean that he would have been in his 20s when he first came on the scene and started to be noticed enough to attract mentions in newspaper articles. He was first documented in Harwinton, Connecticut in 1858, a couple of years before the Civil War broke out. He spent 25 years roaming the New England states of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont, as well as New York State and Canada. For some unknown reason, in 1883, 25 years after simply wandering around in no particular direction, he began his 365-mile, 34-day hiking route. This cycle meant that for any given calendar year, he would complete that cycle between 10 and 11 times. He passed through the same towns on the same 34-day schedule, so if you do the math, that means that over the six years that the leather man was doing his circuitous route, he visited each town 60 to 65 times.
Michael says that the Leatherman story has two aspects to it. First and foremost, of course, the sheer incredible nature of the clockwork-like hiking cycle. But second, how the Leatherman story fit into the historical context of the day. Regarding the incredible nature of it, Michael says that story kind of sells itself. To me, the most fascinating thing about him is the fact that he was so completely regimented. He was so predictable. People knew when he was going to show up in their town and they would leave food for him and, and you could predict it up to the hour. That's not an agent of chaos. That's different. Michael says, however, that by putting the Leatherman story into the right historical context, well, it tells us a lot about ourselves. By the time the Leatherman started his incredible hiking cycle, two major events had occurred, the Civil War and what's been called the Long Depression. The Long Depression followed a financial panic in the United States, and it was so bad that it had a global impact and took six years to bring the economy back into functioning order. Unemployment was estimated to be in double digits. It was so desperate for unemployed men that many became homeless and wandered from town to town looking for odd jobs. Some simply tried to make a living off of theft. Many had drinking problems. Society came up with several rather derisive terms for these men, tramps, bums, and hobos. A tramp was somebody who worked only when forced to. A bum never worked at all. And a hobo was a traveling worker who migrated from town to town looking for work. There were other terms as well, vagabonds, idlers, transients, tipplers, and tavern haunters. If a homeless man stayed in the community for three months, they were legally entitled to support services from the town. And for many towns, caring for the indigent became their largest expenditure. So towns felt they had to draw a line. The town selectmen would visit these newcomers as their three-month window was nearing an end and warn them off. In other words, tell them to leave. And if that didn't work, they'd return with a few men and physically remove them. In the case of the leather man, he certainly looked like a hobo, but his actions didn't mimic those of a hobo. He was self-sufficient, living in caves. He didn't beg for food. He would only take it if offered. He didn't steal. He wasn't a drunkard, and he never hurt anybody. In other words, he was different than the others who wandered in and out of towns. But to Michael, it's his difference that set him apart. Not so much his difference from the other unemployed men, but his difference from the New Englanders he would meet along the way in those days. People talk, and by then word had gotten around that the leather man spoke French and didn't eat meat on Fridays, something that Michael says was completely different from the customs in the region. New England for centuries had been a bastion of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants whose origins were in England. But after the Civil War, you start to see an influx of immigrants from particularly Canada, French Canada. And with this influx of newcomers came the need for the settlers of the area to discuss the change in society around them. The story of the leather man gave them a perfect opportunity. They perceived something about him being different and their world was changing. And I suspect that this is part of why his story was so gripping. In fact, it was so gripping that many people have taken it upon themselves to try to answer the riddles surrounding the leather man's life. One such effort was made by Woodbury resident William Gordon, who subsequently moved to Danbury, where he became well known for his work on the leather man's case. William said his research indicated that the leather man was in fact James Borglay of Lyon, France. Borglay was the son of a tannery owner in France, and he was also the suitor of the daughter of one of France's foremost leather speculators, the Laurent family. Well, Bourglay inadvertently caused the financial ruin of the Laurent family, and he became inconsolable and fled France. Gordon says that the timing of that story matched the timing of when the leather man first appeared in Harrington in 1858, and his narrative stuck. When the leather man died, his first gravestone said, James Bourglay. However, it would turn out that that theory was debunked after the leather man had passed on. Another person who took keen interest in the story was the late Dan DeLuca, who did live in Meriden. He published his findings in 2008 in the book entitled The Old Leather Man. In his book are a 20-year compilation of newspaper stories from 1869 to 1889, many photos of the leather man, details of the many places where he stopped, 
and recountings of interactions with residents passed down over the decades. Dan's theory has been more widely accepted than any other. He argues that the leather man was the son of a French woodsman and a Native American woman. He said that his evidence suggests that the leather man was partially raised by Native Americans, notably the grandfather on his mother's side. This would certainly account for his outdoor survival skills. Michael says there's another strong historical reality that makes this quite plausible. The whole French-Canadian culture has been informed for centuries by by intermarriage with Native people anyway. Dan DeLuca said that he believes the incessant 365-mile, 34-day cycle began shortly after his Native American grandfather passed away in 1882. In fact, the cycle began within a year of that death. Dan also believes that there may have been a tendency towards obsessive-compulsive behavior that was triggered by the grandfather's death. He says that the leather man had to be precisely on time. He kept his cave sites neat and clean with everything in place. That's how they found them after his death. The stitching in his leather garments, which could be more closely observed after his death, had all the lacing consistently laying flat and not at all twisted. The pipes he used to smoke tobacco were all made precisely the same way, no variation. In short, everything he did for those last six years of his life had to be perfect. The Leather Man's cyclical pattern was actually uncovered by a man living in the Forestville section of the town of Bristol by the name of Chauncey Hotchkiss. Like many people, Chauncey observed the Leather Man intently whenever he passed through town. After about two years, Chauncey started to notice a pattern. The Leather Man would eat lunch at the home of I.W. Beach every 34 days. And after eating, he'd then walk past the Forestville post office. He noted that this was happening between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but usually right at 2 o'clock. So Chauncey decided to follow this unusual man. He used his horse and kept enough of a distance so as to not raise suspicion. He put together the long list of towns visited, and it was finally published in the newspaper, with reporters then calling him Old Leathery. Eventually, the leather man's arrival in particular towns became a happening on the social calendar. School teachers often let their students out of class at the appointed time so they could hold out their hand with an apple or a sandwich for the leather man as he would pass by, and children would be thrilled if he took their offering. After years of making his infamous cycle, residents started, though, to notice a change. His health was deteriorating, and he was becoming more dependent on food handouts. At one point, some good Samaritans in Middletown, Connecticut, actually had him arrested so he could be given medical treatment. He snuck out of the hospital, though, and nobody tried that assistance again. In January of 1889, the leather man passed by the home of J.H. Benedict in Reading, Connecticut. The woman there spoke French. Her husband was a doctor. He was clearly in need of medical help, and she tried to convince him to let her husband have a look. The leather man refused. She gave him two cups of coffee, a bottle of milk, and he went on his way. Well, two months later, while sleeping in a cave near George Dell's farm in Mount Pleasant, New York, the leather man died. It was March 20th, 1889. His death was announced prominently on the front pages of newspapers from New York City to Hartford, bringing sadness throughout the region. Local residents had his remains buried in the paupers section of the Sparta Cemetery in Osney, New York, His headstone said plainly, James Borglay. The location of the grave was on the edge of busy Route 9. It turns out many visitors came to pay their respects, not only immediately after his passing, but for many decades to come. Interest in this mysterious man continued on. Finally, 120 years after his passing, the Osnian Historical Society petitioned to have his grave moved away from busy Route 9 noting that it was dangerous for all the visitors who continued to flock to his grave. Michael says that the reinterment left as many questions about the leather man as his life did. His body was exhumed. They wanted to see, you know, who is this guy? What's the story? They found some nails and some dirt uh, and some bits and pieces of leather. They didn't find him at all. By now, however, the incorrect identification of the leather man as James Borglame had become well known. And at the new grave site, the locals now put on his headstone the same name that's on his official death certificate. 
the Leather Man. So how does Michael, who's an expert in these types of legendary tales, rate the Leather Man story compared to all the others he's heard across New England? The fact that this story about this guy from the 1880s still holds people in people's interest today is suggestive of why I would put it at the top. That's it for this episode of Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I want to thank my guest for this episode, Michael Hoberman, Professor of American Literature at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. Please follow me on my main podcast website so you'll know when the next episode is published. AmazingTalesCT.Podbean.com Also in between episodes, you can check out my pages on Facebook at Amazing Tales CT or Instagram, also Amazing Tales CT. That's where I place photos supplementing my podcasts. Plus, I'd love to hear from you. And please feel free to send me an idea of a story you'd like me to look into. If you liked what you heard, spread the word with your friends and family. See you next time here on Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I'm Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. We'll be right back.